Hello and welcome. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, my name is Jim Plank. I'm with Haymarket Books. Um, we're so excited and lucky today to be joined by three guests. Um, Philip Agnew, the, an organizer with Black Men Build, um, Kianga Yamada Taylor, a uh, writer and activist, um, whose latest article is uh, Voting Trump Out is Not Enough. Um, and we're here uh, with Mark Lamont Hill, um, and we're here to celebrate the release um, of his new book uh, from Haymarket Books, um, We Still Hear, uh, Pandemic, Policing, Protest, and Possibility. Um, obviously, lots to talk about. Um, so um, I really want to encourage people. We're up against uh, Barack Obama's new book, which is coming up next week. So pick up a copy for yourself, pick up a copy for your comrades, pick up a copy for your family. Uh, this is a book that people need to read together, discuss together. Um, and so we're uh, very excited to be um, starting the conversation here tonight. Um, just a couple of quick announcements. Um, one, uh, there will be closed captions, uh, live closed captions for tonight's event. Um, there'll be a link to uh, the captions in the chat, how to access the captions. And we're thankful to Sandra for uh, doing the live closed captioning tonight. Um, and just a couple of upcoming um, events that Haymarket has in our Haymarket Books Live series. Um, on Wednesday, we have an event with David Harvey and Amna Akbar on organizing collective solutions to the problems of our time. Um, and on Thursday, uh, we have an, uh, an event with um, S.A. Smythe, Zoe Samudzi, Bedur Alagra on uh, crisis, catastrophe, and genocide. Um, that's hosted by Robin D.G. Kelly. Um, and you can see links to other upcoming Haymarket events um, in the chat. Um, so uh, there will be time for um, audience questions uh, at the end, near the end. So post those in the chat and I'll be um, coming back to um, ask some of those questions. Um, but for now, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark who's gonna say a few things and then uh, Kianga and Phil will um, grill him on where we go from here. Um, so, yeah, take it away, Mark. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm so at peace to everybody uh, that's out here watching this event uh, via YouTube and every other way that people watch stuff. Uh, I am so excited to be here and so excited about this book. Uh, we still hear, you know, when you when you write books, um, it can be draining. It can be exhausting. Um, but it never gets old when when it's when you're able to put something in the hands of people that you think might matter. And it is my sincerest hope um, that this book will matter. You know, I'm I'm honored to be part of the the Haymarket family. You know, when when I think about as an author, and maybe this is to my detriment, I don't necessarily think about who's going to give me the biggest check or you know what's going to make me most likely to make a, this list or get that award. I think about you know what traditions I want to be a part of. Um, when I wrote The Classroom in the Cell with Mumia Abu-Jamal, um, I was like, I want to be part of Third World because that's where I saw Gwendolyn Brooks. That's where I saw, you, you know what I mean? Like, that's where I saw Francis Cress Wilson. I grew up in, in a black book tradition and I wanted to be part of that tradition. Um, and for me, Haymarket was like, yo, Kianga's over there. Angela Davis is over there. I mean, it was like people whose work I admire a great deal um, are over there. And I'm like, I'm doing these Haymarket events with dope people. I want to be a Haymarket author. <laughs> you know, um, and I don't take it lightly that I am a Haymarket author now. And and officially today, I am a Haymarket author. Um, and I'm very, very honored to be part of, of a tradition that has so many wonderful authors, but more importantly, that's committed to leaving the world um, better than they found it. And and that to me means everything. Um, this specific, and also I'm, I'm, I'm so excited to be in conversation with Kianga Yamada Taylor and, and, and Philip Agnew, like these are my friends, these are my comrades, these are people who I can call for ideas, advice, um, to talk trash, to, to laugh hysterically, to you, you know, and 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 both of you mean a lot to me, um, and I admire you both very deeply. Uh, your commitments, your political commitments, your work in the world, your ideas, uh, your love of the people, um, they mean a lot to me, and. I don't take it lightly that you all took time today to to um, to engage me um, and to take the book seriously and to read it. 
And Kianga, you wrote the forward. Um, <laughs> and <clears throat> I know I gave you a whole lot of notice. Um, <laughs> I'm like, what you doing this weekend? Um, uh, and, and so I'm grateful for the, the sacrifice you made to give me a brilliant forward and a wonderful forward um, that really sets the book off. Um, so I'm just grateful for all of it. Um, I wrote this book um, somewhat unexpectedly. I, I was working on um, a couple of other projects and uh, like everybody else, the world stopped for me. Um, COVID hit, nobody was going outside. Um, but for me, it was also a personal, a personal note. I was sitting um, in a hospital with my father who, who is 92. Um, he was very ill, he got an infection. And uh, I was hoping that he would get better. The doctors were uncertain. He wasn't eating. We were just trying to make sure he was okay. And as I was sitting in that hospital with him in February, February turned into March, and his condition was uncertain. And the hospital told us we couldn't come back because of COVID. And I didn't know if I'd seen him for the last time. And they sent him back to a nursing home, his nursing home. Um, still couldn't visit him. March turned into April, turned to May, turned to June. Still couldn't see him. And so there's a way that the very real material impact of COVID for me was felt. And there was a day in, in, in May or June where after George Floyd had been killed by the state, they were planning a big protest downtown. And I was already on the fence about going downtown because I'm 41 and I'm in good health, but like 41 ain't 21. And I was like, I don't know if this COVID, this COVID thing definitely ain't for me. And I don't, I don't know if I want to be in a protest. Um, and, but I was also concerned that if I, that at any given moment, they could let us back into the nursing home. And I wanted to see my father. And, and I was trying to figure out these choices. Do I go out and risk COVID, risk getting sick for myself, and also risk people who I love um, in order to protest the state killing us? Or do I stay, stay at home and feel like I'm doing nothing to resist the fact that the state is ritually killing us, right? Um, and the, these choices put you in a kind of ignoble paradox. And, and, and you're in this conundrum where you don't know what to do. And you're wrestling with this question that I talk about in the intro to the book, which is, in what way will I resist death today? And, and for me, that, that's what it means to be black in America or to be vulnerable in America, not, not just black. Blackness brings its own particular set of, of vulnerabilities, but um, what it means to be vulnerable in this country. And, and, and I was wrestling with that. And I wanted to think through why I felt that way and why I felt so acutely vulnerable in that moment. And why so many others felt acutely vulnerable in that moment. I mean, COVID didn't create, it created new vulnerabilities, but it exposed other vulnerabilities. Uh, and I want to think through what that meant. You know, I, I remember as America likes to do, you know, they talk about, they do this universalizing move where they say, we're all in this together. You know, it's like after 9-11, we're all in this together. Except if you're Muslim or you're South Asian or you're Sikh or, or, or you know, you're in this a little bit more, right? It, 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 we're, we got COVID-19, we're all in this together because we're all equally vulnerable. Yeah, but if you're a frontline worker, if you are living in a housing project, if you're caged in, in, in a dungeon in, 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 in any of the prisons around the United States, if if you're in a nursing home, you're you're in this in a different kind of way. And so I wanted to think through not just the pre-existing health conditions that we all may or may not have, but to think about these structural pre-existing conditions of racism, of poverty, um, and how we could think through them in different ways to expose something else. But right as we're dealing with COVID, we're also dealing with, with state violence. And, 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 and again, it's not new, but we're exposed to it in, in, in certain kinds of ways that, that, that were different. And looking at the intersections of those, of those, of those things was interesting to me. And, and, and what I want to talk about today with my, my friends and comrades is that question of pandemic what it means to think to live in a pandemic, what it means to think about the pandemic, not just as a, as a medical crisis, but as a social and structural crisis, um, to think about the crisis of policing um, and also the politics of protest. You know, we saw an extraordinary set of nationwide and indeed global protests that left me inspired and excited um, and a little frustrated, you know, but to see people on the streets of, of Minneapolis screaming for abolition 
was heartwarming. You know, I, I came up in the 90s. I remember when we were protesting uh, to take Mumia off death row or when we would hit the streets when Rodney King is beaten. And we just wanted, you know, we were hoping to arrest some cops or, or get the LAPD to not have a 99 percent clearance rate after pe- police get investigated for killing us. Um, and to see the progression, to see the kind of freedom dreams of of, um, of critical resistance and other black revolutionaries become to fruition in such a way that we're no longer the crazy extremists calling for abolition, but suddenly people in in, in the House of Represent in the, in the um, in City Council and House of Representatives are having legitimate conversations about it um, was was somewhat extraordinary, and there was some frustration too. I mean, you know, to see those abolition conversations turn to uh, defunding conversations turn to reform conversations turn to people in kente cloth taking knees um, raises some questions again about how we can hold on to the kind of radical teeth of a movement but but it's there and it's never been more possible than it is right now and for that reason despite all this frustration all the contradictions of the moment I've never been more confident that we'll be victorious and that's what the book is about. It's about saying that despite all this stuff, despite all the efforts of the state to erase us, to marginalize us, to kill us, we still here. But our existence isn't the only thing. We're also carrying with us a radical imagination and a radical dream that can get us somewhere else. And for me, that's an abolitionist vision. That includes reparations. That includes so many other things. Um, but it's a vision that's affirmative, not just talking about what we don't want, but thinking about the world that we want to see, thinking about the structures that we want to create, the social relationships we want to have, the world we want to build is in front of us, and I believe in it. Um, and I want to say one more thing. Um, there's a sister on, a, on, on the front of this uh, cover, um, uh, Lauren Corsi. I don't know her. I, I, I saw her at, at, uh, at one of the rallies that I didn't go to, again, because I was, I was, I was in COVID hiding, although I ended up getting COVID anyway, um, so, so much for that. I um, but part of why I wanted her in the front, and part of why I love this image, is because so much of the freedom dream, so much of the radical imagination um, that we have, I think, is owed to Black women, and particularly uh, Black ra- the Black radical feminist tradition. Um, when I think about the best moments of our tradition, so many of the most ambitious and robust and expansive and inclusive freedom dreams have been offered to us by Black women, and I'm very excited and inspired by that. Um, I, I, and, and there's a wonderful book on Haymarket uh, about the Combahee uh, River Collective and, and part of, you know, edited by Kanga. And, and part of what we learn at Combahee is, you know, these, uh, it would have been perfectly appropriate for, for, for black women to speak only against gender injustice, to speak only against patriarchy, to speak out only against sexism. But their freedom dream was was inclusive of third world solidarity, inclusive of dismantling capitalism, inclusive of of disrupting all the structures that render us less whole and less human than we than we otherwise could be. That's important to me. When I, when I look at what critical resistance has done, when I look at the work that came out of the Bay with regard to prison abolition and dismantling the prison industrial complex, it comes out of people who could have just focused on a singular area, but the Joy Jameses and the and the and the Mary Macabas and the and the Ruth Wilson Gilmores and the Angela Y. Davises, they they had a different, more expansive freedom dream. Um, and, and that's not exclusive to them. It's part of a long tradition. And we stand on their shoulders. And this book owes not just a conceptual debt, but a political debt um, and an ethical debt uh, to that tradition and to those people. And so I'm glad um, to be a part of it. This is a small book, um, but I hope that it makes a contribution to the conversation, to those who are trying to organize, to those who are trying to teach, to those who are trying to study, to those who are trying to make sense of the world. And that, that's all I got to say. I I, I, I I don't want to be that book dude that talks too much. So I want to be in conversation with y'all. And that's way more important to me. So again, thank y'all for being here. Thank y'all for talking to me. Glad to be here. Small book just means people will read it, um, (laughs) which is important. Let me just say that um, I think, uh, I mean, I I have lots of thoughts about the, the pandemic and, uh, we should talk about that, but I think one of the most important um, contributions right now is uh, to have a, a book that intervenes on the questions that need to be answered, but framed uh, in ways that you describe. that is based on not what is possible, what is pragmatic, 
um, but that pushes the boundaries, pushes the parameters of how we think about what change should look like. And I don't know if it's serendipitous or what, but that is right on time when we have this hideous debate already emerging from the smoldering pile of rubble that was this presidential election mm. where within hours you have these Democratic Party functionaries coming out of the gutter and the woodwork to tell us to calm down, to shut up, to unite and heal with the uh, Republican Party that has donned a white robe embraced the worst of Trumpism, um, that has championed the cause of white supremacy, that these are the people we are supposed to heal and, and unify with while the leadership of this party takes out their daggers and goes for AOC, for the squad, for Cori Bush, for Jamal Bowman, for the left within its ranks who are trying to think beyond the parameters, think beyond what is possible. And so within that context, um, your book comes in to preserve the space for what you describe, what Robin Kelly has described, our freedom dreams, uh, which is to not let our expectations be managed by this corrupt, destabilizing, demoralizing, dehumanizing system um, but that we know that there is a possibility for a different kind of world, for a different kind uh, of future that we have to be prepared to, to fight for. Um, and so I, I captured that from your book almost immediately, which is why, you know, you could ask me 36 hours beforehand to write a forward and, you know, <laughs> I would drop everything to do it because I knew like this is, this is, an important book that that people, especially in a sea of such terrible arguments, a sea of such confusion, um, we actually need clear politics. We need politics that are, are based in, in history, that are based in uh, the traditions that you speak of, that are based in the struggles of, of Black people, but other marginalized and oppressed people who have tried to conjure this different vision of what humanity can be. And so, you know, I'm certainly glad to have assisted with that in terms of introducing the book, but you certainly did uh, the heavy lifting. And I'm glad that the book is, is, is out. And I want to encourage people uh, to not just read it, but to, to get together and talk about it and, and really dig into it and think about, um, you know, how do we... How do we act collectively um, to to get to the kind of, of future uh, that Mark imagines and that we all are uh, struggling to to win? Yeah, I'm I'm equally excited and honored to be a part of the conversation. Um, you know, this year has been particularly I wouldn't even say hard. It's just been very very trying for a lot of people. And um, I keep going back to the Lenin quote, there, there are decades when nothing happens, and then there are years where decades happen. And mm. this has been, this has been, if there were a year for that quote um, to be said, you know, people always say there was the best of times, it was the worst of times, but if there were a year that that quote was more appropriate, um, you know, it would be this year. And the thing, and I agree with everything Kianga said, um, the thing that really got me about the book for me as I was digesting it, and I, one highly recommended already of, I got a list of people I'm sending it to, right? You're sending me some, I'm sending it out to people, is I kept thinking how we got over. I've forgotten, I, I, I didn't anticipate emotions to come from this. I have forgotten the thing, many of the things that have happened to us this year. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, genuinely, genuinely, I had forgotten by the time George Floyd came around. I remember there was a time and I don't want to make it about me, but there was a time during that period that um, I had done a, a, a talk for 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 um, for Rashida Tlaib 
and it, it, you know, and the talk was on police brutality. It, it, it had just been right after um, Ahmaud Arbery. Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, maybe about three weeks later, I was asked to do another Zoom talk. And uh, I don't know. I know you all don't do this, but I say, hey, I'll use the same talk I did before. <laughs> uh, you, know, it, 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 you know, this, this looks relevant. And when I went to read it, it was entirely irrelevant to the moment because George Floyd had happened. It, 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 it was just, I read it and I, I thought to myself, oh, you know, crap, luckily I read this the day before because so much has happened in that month. And to bring it back to the book, We Still Here, it really, I had an emotional thing, a reaction to it because the way that it chronicled even the things that we had overcome this year, everything had been thrown at us but the kitchen sink. And, and the book doesn't even arrive at the election. The, the the book, which is a question that I actually have for you, the book doesn't even arrive at what some people might say is singularly the most important part of the year, this presidential election. In fact, it doesn't even touch on it a great deal in contrast to Corona, in contrast to the to police brutality. Um, but I, I think this book is so important, even as a balm to everything Kianga is saying. The possibility is there about where we can go, but the 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 title, and I mean this deeply, the title "We Still Here" is a very is a balming statement for this moment when hyper normalization has forced us to wake up in circumstances dramatically different than six seven days ago, and still have to go and move so much so that we forget. And you know that's the the kind of macabre brilliance of the American project, the rapid amnesia, rapid amnesia. Forget that. Forget that. We got something else. Forget that. No, you know, no we walk it off. We fit, you know, forget that. And so I think this book is important for people to read this year, right? For people to read, even while some ways may say we're still in it, right? We are. Um, as a balm to just remember, hey, remember you, we, we, we did this actually in February and in March and in April and May. Um, and so I really enjoyed reading, reading it. Um, you know, every revolutionary duty is to know what time it is. Mm. And you really situated, you know, the present, the future, the past very, very well. And it didn't feel like I was kind of, you know, I, it took me a while to get through the Robin Kelly's intro to, to Cedric Robinson. So I, I, you know what I'm saying? I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> um, and, 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 it, and it's brilliant. Um, but I think what you did, what you did with this, this volume really, um, it really touched me in, in not just a cerebral way. Um, I'd like to say, I know a lot of this stuff in here, but the memory of this, um, even for this year was important. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate to be able to talk to you all about it. Oh, thanks, man. I, 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 and I'm interested to know what y'all think about sort of this election piece. Of, you know, obviously, at, at some point, you got to stop writing and, you know, for this book to come out. And so I, I wanted I, the, the election was happening. We were entering the thick of things. I'll be honest. I, I wasn't certain that there'd be a Trump victory when I started the project. Mm -hmm. um, I think the last 60 days or so kind of sealed the deal. Um, and so part of me w wasn't even thinking about a sort of Biden moment um, mm -hmm. because I felt like we'd still be locked in the Trump moment. Mm -hmm. But but it's interesting because I'm, I'm not sure how radically different a Biden moment will be with regard to many of the issues that are raised here. You know, in, in, the, in the and I think all of us were so fairly publicly supportive of the Sanders campaign in the, in the Democratic primary. Um, and part of why I was and, and that was honestly the first time that I, I, I had sort of publicly supported any candidate mm -hmm. uh, outside of the Green Party in a very long time. Um, and the reason was because I thought that there might be an opportunity to not just sort of keep fascism at arm's length, but to actually put move in the other direction, to actually imagine some new possibilities. And once that did not happen, uh, and we had Biden as, as the alternative option, I still thought Biden was a better alternative to Trump. And I, I had to be pragmatic in, in ways that I perhaps haven't been before, that I definitely have, maybe haven't been before. Um, but I also want to be mindful to those who, who are thinking about this stuff, particularly in, in, in the kind of uh, joy of, 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 of November 3rd and November 4th and really like November 7th. Mm -hmm. um, 
to you know as we're dancing in the streets and people are celebrating and all the stuff that happens when you when you watch fascism end or or when you think fascism has end ended um to think about how so many of the things that forced us into such extraordinary vulnerability in the last 10 months are not particular to Donald Trump or the Trump presidency there are ways that Trump's mismanagement of covid-19 has led to um unnecessary death no doubt about that there's a way that his response um, to the crisis in terms of the, the types of reforms he looked for, the type of economic interventions he, he, he went to, um, left certain small business owners and everyday working, working people more vulnerable than they otherwise could have been. There's no doubt about that. But part of what I want to get at in the book, and I think you all are pointing to it quite accurately, is that the conditions for this type of crisis and disaster were already there. And there's an extraordinary confluence of things that are happening, like a, a global health pandemic that we didn't fully anticipate, and, and maybe the worst president in modern American history. Um, that combination, right, is, is, is a particular thing. But the conditions that allow a Walmart or a Target to exploit that are already there. Um, the prisoners who are, the, the people who are incarcerated, you know, they're, the conditions that allow them to be exploited um, so that they're making hand sanitizer and they're uh, protective equipment, but can't. And the idea that we're OK with that as a general public because of the, the disposability of those who are in the car um, is a pre-existing structural condition that, that would have happened under Joe Biden. Because um, remember, it's, it, it's, it's Andrew Cuomo that's being celebrated for. For, for 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 straightening up New York, it's 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 the heir apparent of Democratic leadership, who's being celebrated for how he managed New York City, while those aging incarcerated folk are still in prison dying. Right? Well, I mean, so so we have to think about that. The nursing homes weren't properly addressed. People, and, and even before Trump, hundreds of thousands of people die in nursing homes of preventable infections. This, this is part of the disposability culture that we that we operate in. Mm. This happens anyway. The, the the set of economic conditions that allow Amazon to exist as an economic behemoth aren't didn't start you know in uh in, in 2016 so i don't i i don't i don't want to understate the significance of getting rid of donald trump absolutely important but when you usher in a biden presidency that says they believe in quote unquote law and order they don't believe in defunding they don't support a green new deal he thinks billionaires should exist um, he identifies as Zionist. I mean, we could go on down the list of things. Um, we have to one manage our expectations, but also have give ourselves the charge to to know what our work is, which is the point of Kanga's wonderful article, right? The, the work starts now of, of 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 moving Biden and these centrist Democrats to the left instead of stigmatizing and demonizing and marginalizing those. Those even those Democrats like the squad and others who actually were trying to articulate a more progressive agenda, we have to say that's the bar, that's the standard, and we have to start moving even them to the left a bit, as opposed to this kind of pragmatic politics that doesn't work out for us and leaves the vulnerable um, incredibly um, in, in, in a greater state of precarity. Um, so, I mean, I, I, part of what I wonder is, how, first of all, how y'all feeling after the election, what y'all kind of analysis is, and, and how you think this Biden move is going to impact these things we're talking about around pandemic and protesting and policing and stuff like that. Well, I'll just say that I agree with, with all that. I think that, you know, the Democrats would love for us to believe that Trump is the root of all evil. And, you know, once you pull that root up, then we can get back to normal. And as many people have alluded to, uh, the normal is what gave us Donald Trump, right? Mm, Black yeah. Lives Matter erupted during Barack Obama's presidency. Occupy Wall Street erupted during um, Barack Obama's presidency. And the failure of the Obama administration in two terms to, uh, to adequately, really substantively respond to the crises that have been created by George W. Bush um, is what created the conditions for Donald Trump uh, to be president. And so if the Biden administration thinks that they can kind of wax on about bipartisanship uh, and unity, 
um, and creating reforms on, uh, you know, Mitch McConnell's terms um, or, you know, John Kasich's terms, then they're going to be in for a rude awakening because I believe that uh, he had about an eight hour honeymoon that was Saturday night. People were dancing in the streets and, you know, I'm here in Philly and it was crazy. Uh, I wasn't even downtown. I was, you know, on Germantown Avenue and, you know, people were literally dancing in the street (laughs) for about 12 hours. Um, But here's how COVID works. You know, I I know I I got the news on my uh, phone. People across the street from me came out on their porch and were popping bottles of champagne. And, you know, we went out and hung out on the, the, the strip and came home and a few hours later got a uh, email from my kid's daycare uh, that said that basically they would be shutting down for a week because there are two teachers and an administrator uh, who have COVID. Uh-huh. Well, one, one teacher, one administrator, and then another teacher who lives with her mother who got COVID. Um, and so this is how COVID works, is that as much as the political establishment, the economic titans would love to turn the page, they can't. It's the pandemic that is setting the pace of, of, of politics and uh, expectation. And so this means that uh, the Biden people are going to either have to do things that they have never done before. Um, they're going to have to, you know, Biden has always been a, uh, on the right of the Democratic Party, a deficit hawk. You know, we, we can't have deficits. We don't want to spend. Um, but that's exactly what this moment uh, calls for. And I think we have all seen, you know, the long, hot summer has turned into the warm fall, right? I mean, there, there was an uprising in Philly two weeks ago. The National Guard was deployed to Philadelphia uh, mm. two weeks ago. So the protests have, have continued. You know, the election has eclipsed everything, but the organizing, the protest, the anger, the bitterness has not gone away. Um, and, you know, I don't believe that it will be stuffed in a box and put away so that Joe Biden has time uh, to uh, roll out his agenda. We don't have time. There are, there are more cases in the United States today than there ever have been. The pandemic is raging completely out of control in this country. And we still have this criminal administration in power for another 10 weeks. God knows what will happen um, in the next 10 weeks with these lunatics at the helm. Um, And so that is a recipe for continued conflict and confrontation. And again, to come back to the book, that is when politics and history is most crucial because demonstrations just for the sake of demonstrating and demonstrations, you know, on, uh, in and of themselves are important, but they're not enough because at some point, then we have to argue for what we want. We have to make demands. We have to be organized so that we can consistently press for those demands, that we can figure out what has worked and what has not worked in one place or another and have that impact and change our organizing. And for all of that, it means we need greater conversation, uh, politics, cohesion. And, you know, I think Mark's book, especially when we're talking about the, 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 the pandemic, which is at the center of everything happening in American society and the globe, you know, that it comes at a critical time when we need to figure out, you know, how, what is our posture in this moment? When we have, it's easy when you have evil in the administration, it, it makes, it makes, you know, who the enemy is, it makes coming together, it makes all of that, that easy. But now when you have this duplicitous, when we go back, I mean, this is the thing about Trump is that it's unvarnished neoliberalism, right? You don't, you, the arguments are, are quick, they're easy because you just open the newspaper and you've got this buffoon standing there making all the arguments for you, connecting all the dots for you. 
it's really hard when you've got, you know, Joe Biden and and the whole apparatus of the Democratic Party telling you one thing while something else is going on, creating this illusion um, that they actually care about your pain and care about what is happening to you while simultaneously not doing a damn thing about it or not doing enough uh, about it. And so, you know, that is a much harder road to hoe, although people learn more um, about what we're up against um, in those conditions. So it's a, you know, it's, it's, we're in for a rough ride, but you know, we've, uh, this is the good thing about Haymarket is politically kind of gearing us up to be able to understand it, to know what we see in front of us, um, and then to, to try to do something about it. You, I I mean, I'm not just saying it, you took the notes right off my page towards the end there. Um, you know, the next, Donald Trump will not be so me, you know, Mm -hmm. he, he will, um, the, the next Donald Trump and, you know, he could still run again. But I think what, what, what faces us is, you know, frankly, still 70 or so million people who sided with this openly monstrous person and personality and probably half of the 70 or so million people who voted for Joe Biden, who aren't really willing to go the whole road with us, right? And so, you know, I think that is the challenge before us right now. You said it, that's where I was going right there, that we've got to, energy doesn't dissipate. Um, It people, you know, the energy and the anger that's happening in the streets is gonna either get focused inside towards a partner or some uh, build black group or buy black the, you know, buy back the block group or, Um, a book club, that energy is going to get directed somewhere. And the Democrats, of course, hope that it would direct be directed into the promise of what they offer. But I think we've got to divide to unite. And I think we've got to continue to force a fracture within the Democratic Party. Um, We've got to continue to draw that wedge. And I don't, you know, I'm actually, this is a place of study for me. I don't know whether a third party is where we're going here. Um, and I'm not against it at all. I'm just talking about how we actually do it on the state level and the, and the federal level. But we've got to force this fracture within the Democratic Party. There are legitimate factions forming within the Democratic Party in a way that they haven't in a, well, they haven't in maybe our generation. They were consolidated around a neoliberal agenda and they won out. And we now have legitimate factions forming within this Democratic Party that really, by and large, has no identity. The party doesn't. The factions do, seeking to run mm-hmm. the party. And so I think we've got to continue to force that fracture. I think this is, I don't know how controversial this comes off, but I, I think we've got to be deliberate in this moment of saying we are not preparing to roll out the red carpet for a Kamala presidency, right? Where we're, we're not, we mm-hmm. are not, we are not willing participants in destiny, in a democratic destiny right now, right? And that is uncomfortable for people to say the promise of a a South Asian black woman president who is a AKA, I'm my alpha, you know, you know, this, this is ski fi in the White House. I mean, this is, this is, this is uh, this is amazing that we are not willing to lay down on the road to destiny, right? And say this is what is going to happen. We need to we need to be legitimate and say, you know, by 2024, we're going to be looking for completely new things to come out of the Democratic Party, and that is why we're forcing this fracture right now. Um, and so I agree with everything Kianga said. I don't want to um, double up on anything, but you know that's that's what's before us to make sure that tranquility and passivity and all of those things that are talked about right now are thrown to the wind, um, and that that energy isn't subsumed by the Democratic Party as it stands right now. Now there are some factions that I would definitely get behind, or at least get with, um, but we've got we've got to continue to to push. Um, the the other the other point for us is that you know we don't we don't have very long to to really make that move and so we've got to force some real decisions and polarization over the next few weeks and months and i think 
we, you know, we keep saying they don't have a honeymoon. We don't have a honeymoon. And I know a lot of people are really, really, really hoping and anticipating a moment of respite. You know, the holidays are coming up and I, I understand that. But we've got to really, really force, you know, force this um, or, or else it will be consolidated quite quickly. Um, and we already are seeing it. I'm, mm -hmm. on, you know, on Twitter, they're saying, hold on, wait, wait, let people let people celebrate or, or, or how could you espouse, you know, such anger or sourness in this happy <laughs> moment? And the thing we have to read, you know, I think the matter of uh, us forgetting so quickly, I think we have to remind each other, hey, five months ago, we thought we were on the cusp of something, something right. You know, you were right beside me at the rally, you know, like you, we were both hired staff members on this campaign. How could you say this to me now, six months before? And you've been bludgeoned and bludgeoned and bludgeoned, I understand, by uh, what is a horrible reality, but that can't cause you to be so happy that we forget the mission. And um, I think I think that's just what we've got to do as uh, people centered movements is we've we've got to fight that fight in, in the immediate and not worry about the niceties in this moment, because it's it we've seen it happen so swiftly. Um, and Joe Biden's no no Obama, but they've got all the pieces. What do you all see as some of those issues that could be um, the, ripe for the, to create the kind of fracture that you're talking about because you said you kind of got to we kind of have to divide to unite again mm -hmm. um and you know in the book one of the things I, I think about a lot uh perhaps more than anything else is the question of abolition the question of um how we can reimagine the role of police and prisons in society and ultimately move to a world without them um and that for me even at, at, in terms of organizing talking to organizers working with activists uh thinking at the policy level there seems to be some ground there for that conversation again it's been whittled down a bit but at least defunding is 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 in the conversation even if it's considered extreme it's still in the conversation which is something it wasn't even six mm -hmm. months ago uh, what do you think about that issue in particular as a site of kind of intervention into the conversation as a, as a space of, of, of start and if it's not that issue what is the what issues do you see as, as possible I'll just say I'll just say really quick. I think the the three four maybe one of them can double for that. Sort of most polarizing uh, issues are, of course, the police um, and what people the the posture of def defund the police as a um, bridge to abolition. Uh, this is clearly something that the leadership of the Democratic Party has come out all guns, all guns blazing on in the aftermath of the uh, election. But I also think it's, I say pandemic, um, in terms of the rescue, the, the, what package is going to be pushed through, through Congress, but connected to that is, of course, Medicare for all. Um, and so... The, the issue with both of those is that we need overwhelming state intervention. And that is something the Republicans have rejected. They have abandoned people who have not received any unemployment or any kind of public intervention since July. These people broke their necks, stopped everything to push a bigot through onto the Supreme Court and meanwhile, you have people facing eviction, hunger, illness in the country that have been left to their own devices. And so Medicare for all and the response to uh, the pandemic, because it's not just the Republicans who uh, are loath to uh, uh, make those kinds of expenditures, but it's also half the Democratic Party, you know, wants to tout its own credentials is reigning in spending, uh, is, is not, you know, being the, the, the tax and spend liberals uh, of, of old. And so that, that has been the conflict with Bernie Sanders uh, throughout, which is Bernie Sanders is like, yes, big government, please, more, more big government. Okay. But, you know, we have big government, of course, for corporate America, and we have big government for the military, but we need big government for people who are actually suffering. 
But I also think housing, because then you're starting to talk about private property, which of course is the lifeblood uh, of American capitalism. And what does it mean to say cancel the rent? Um, because all these other kind of you know weird halfway measures um, are really just kick. It is literally kicking the can down the road because to think that well, we don't have to cancel the rent. We can just keep pushing it off with these moratoria until January. Well, what the hell do you think is about to happen in January? That the people who have been unemployed or underemployed for the last eight months are all of a sudden going to be able to pay five, six, seven months of back rent? No. So that debt must end or we are looking at a cataclysmic human catastrophe of when we are talking about being in the middle of a third wave or a second wave of this deadly pandemic and throwing people into the streets in the months of January and February, I mean, what, what is happening, you know? And so those issues all bring, confront the, the caution, conservatism of the Democratic Party has and there's no way to hide. And this is what I mean about the pandemic driving politics. You can't hide from it. You can't turn the page. You can't act as if it's not happening. You can try that. And then, you know, you can be Notre Dame and thousands of people <laughs> can rush the field after the game. Okay. But let's check those, you know, rates of infection in South Bend. <laughs> right. But you can't get away from it. It is stuck in the middle of, of everything. And so these are the issues that call the question as to what the Democratic Party is going to do. And if they do it wrong, 2022 is, is, is going to go down as the massacre of the Democratic Party. And okay. so, and that is when, you know, I think, I mean, this, this is probably for another book and another conversation, but, you know, the rescue of the Democratic Party, I haven't been convinced. You know, I, I just, these people out of their cold, dead hands, they will be gr grasping this thing until it dies. And so I don't know what that means for us, but I think for our side, you know, we are lacking the kind of org organizational apparatus that can allow us to influence public uh, debate and public opinion and to engage on a high uh, uh, level and to bring all of our disparate smaller projects together into uh, a, a larger organizational force. That's a much bigger question, but these are the kinds of existential uh, realities that I think are animating American politics right now. Agree. We're watching the slow death. Uh, you know, we've been watching it, but we're absolutely watching the slow death of the Democratic Party. I agree. It, it could be a bloodbath. Um, and if we look at rising stars within the Republican Party, and if we listen to Donald Trump's speech from a few days ago, what did he say? We are now the party of working people. We are now the party of inclusion. You can go see it. Mm -hmm. We are now the party of working people. They already understand that they are witnessing a, a widely atrophied Democratic Party that barely, barely, barely where it was able to beat someone who willingly publicly drove every single person in this country to the brink mm -hmm. and barely beat them. You understand this should have been landslide, 48 states, right? And was not able to do that because he was willing. You know, and, and, and I'm not going to, we're not going to go in on, you know, he's gone, right? But he, he was willing, Donald Trump was willing to push him to say all manner of things. I support fracking, I, you know. And so we're, mm -hmm. we're witnessing that and we need, and I think we need to observe that contradiction, know what time it is and position ourselves for that place. The only other thing I'll add, and I know you would have, is, is student debt. I mean, if, mm -hmm. if they do something, if they do something around student debt, I think it underscores in the same way that Kianga was saying with the other issues, it, it strikes at a pillar there. Um, and I don't know how this is connected, but as I'm sitting and kind of sitting and, and thinking to myself sometimes, you know, we're witnessing a real death of the educational system. Yes. And we've been witnessing it for a very, very long time. Young people 
now more than ever, now that they're on computers, right, and just doing everything on computers, now understand that they do not need the the university to do what they want to do in their life. Um, they can do all manner of Maybe you need it to do what you want to do in your life, become a doctor or a lawyer, but not to make money, right? Not to not to become in some way financially stable. You can be a YouTube star. You could be a TikTok star. You could be a, a, you know, you can do all, you could be a model. You can do all these things without need for the university. And so w- w- there's another contradiction there with our educational system. They also know that going to university doesn't also guarantee them any place in work life um, as well. And so I just think if we can push a conversation with the millions of students that currently have debt, and I would just add that to to housing, to policing. Um, The only thing I'll say about defund the police, and I'll keep it super brief, is I do think our movement has to exercise the muscle. And we've already said defund the police, refund the communities. We've also got to talk about, um, you know, we've got to completely, and we're doing it. I'm not saying we're not, but every time we say defund, every time I say it, I say we have to first minimize and well, completely restructure the system that creates the need for police, right? right? And so that's safety. And I know we all know that, but I just think the muscle around saying that on the street is going to be essential because we are, with defund the police specifically, we are getting to a place where the cities are going to do it. And there's going to be one mass robber who knocks over an old lady and the police are going to say, look, our hands were tied. You know, mm-hmm. we, we, we want to be there for black people. We want to be there for our Latino brothers and sisters. <laughs> but but this movement in the streets that doesn't like anybody that uh, doesn't agree with them, that burns things down, has now taken away our budget. And Miss Nelly is now dead because of it. Their blood is on your hands. And so we've got to, we've got, in, in, in what Kianga said, we've got to build the communications bulwark and the political education bulwark over the next few years to really bring our folks along. They already said it in Philly with the the murder of uh, uh, Walter Wallace. Uh, The police chief, ignobly named uh, Danielle uh, Outlaw, um, said that um, the reason why the cops didn't have tasers uh, was because they have been defunded. They've lost their money. And otherwise, they could have tased uh, Mr. Wallace. So, yes, they, they are already cynically looking to deploy that argument whenever they can. Yeah, no, I, I, I think you're both right. And I think political education is the key to helping to reshape those conversations. Again, that's part of why I wrote the book was so that people could be equipped to have those conversations and to articulate that. Because, again, so much of what we've talked about um, as a movement is what we don't want. Um, and I think it's so important to talk about the world we want to see and what it will look like, this idea of producing realities um, where people's needs are met um, is a whole different conversation. And I, I agree, I think, um, in, in the case of Walter Wallace is a really good one. Um, his mother calls the police three times that, that, that Monday um, for mental health support. He's in crisis. He, she needs help. She has no one else to call but the police. And so if we reduce the conversation to whether or not the police had tasers, which is what the police want to do, then it, it, it starts it, it starts the conversation with the presumption that police have to exist as such. <laughs> right. And that the response to a mental health crisis should be resolved by police. Similarly, when Walter, uh, I'm sorry, when Rashard Brooks gets killed in a Wendy's parking lot in Atlanta, he was drunk. He fell asleep in the parking lot. The police show up. And a whole string of things happen and the debate becomes, well, he took the taser and he ran with the taser. And it's like, yeah, we could we could critique the police's response to that. Look, he took the taser and ran away. You have his driver's license. He going home eventually. Right. You didn't have to shoot him. There's a way to make that argument. But again, the more fundamental problem is I'm a Wendy's drive through worker. I'm overworked and underpaid. I just want to go home. And there's a dude in the drive through sleep drunk. (laughs) And the only person I can call in this moment is someone with a gun whose primary understanding and training will prompt him to escalate this to maybe a death sequence. And so before this drunk man makes whatever choices he makes with the police that we could critique or not, um, before the police show up, before we make a decision about what the police could have done, because in all the, the, the hour they took interrogating him, they could have drove, drove him home, you know what I mean, through the keys in the house and called it a day. 
But before any of that happened, we have to ask ourselves, what does it mean to be in a place where the only person I can call in crisis is the police? And that's a more fundamental question about how society operates. And it's very difficult to tell someone who's the victim of, of, of sexual assault, of domestic violence, et cetera, that, all right, we're going to stop calling the police right now. Because that comes from a place of both gender and class privilege to be, a, to, to be able to even say that I have access to other resources to resolve the, the crisis. So structurally, we have to, and I think Phil's right, we have to be able to imagine and ultimately install, offer, imagine, offer, and then install new social structures and mechanisms so that as we're saying we're going to defund the police, what are we refunding? You know, what are we funding? What are we refunding? Because to say refund the community, if we replicate the police force through other means, mm -hmm. right, then we haven't really done that much, right? Um, although I think just having a disarmed public safety force would be an extraordinary step forward. Again, what's the ultimate goal? What's the ultimate project here? And, and I think we have to begin to think through that. Um, and I think that same argument can be made in all these other sectors of life, whether it, and, and, and I think, and this is the last thing I'll say, because I know Jim wants to, I think we're almost time for Q&A yet, yeah, is the, the state in some ways tipped its hand, right? I mean, I think about all the arguments we had in, in Cobra back in the day, um, all the debates people have had on, 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 even on Twitter in the last five years about reparations. And whenever reparations comes up, the, the first thing they say is, well... Where are we going to find the money? Who are we going to give it to? How are we going to decide who needs it? Da, 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 da. Mm -hmm. COVID comes, they giving out, as you say in the hood, they giving out stimmies left and right, right? We get the $1,200 checks pop. They, they found people to give it to real quick when America's economic vitality was on the line. Right. right? <laughs> when we talk about abolition, and, and just one of the key pieces of abolition is decarceration, right? And excarceration, right? Mm -hmm. Both getting people out of prison and also not using the prison as the kind of resolution to these social contradictions and crises, right? Um, but suddenly when COVID hit, the state was like, oh, wait, yeah, we can let them out. They're not they're not violent. Oh, wait, some of them. Yeah, they can go. Um, right. Not enough. Clearly not enough. Um, but my point is they, they they were able to use decarceration strategies when it benefited them. You know, ex oh, wait, we're not going to lock up the small time drug abusers. We're not going to lock up the small. We, we, we don't have the resources because the cops didn't want to get COVID. Right. So it, there's a moment where suddenly giving out money and decarcerating folk was was possible when it was in the state's interest. And so we we have a we always knew it was possible, even though they told us we were crazy. Now, I think the people have seen what's possible in a more robust way. And so I hope that that energy allows us to think through how to resolve these problems around around mass incarceration of the vulnerable around um, lack of access to housing. I mean, Again, like this, like, well, ask, the structural question is not how do we give people money to pay their rent. It's asking the more fundamental question, which Kianga gets in, in in her brilliant new book um, about, about about the role of of, of of land ownership and of profit making around around housing in the first place, right? In the same way, we're calling into question the the actual idea of policing. Let's call into question the actual idea of the landlord, the idea of 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 of, of, of housing being such a crucial piece here, right? Um, and how we access it, rather. Um, these are more fundamental and interesting questions that I think we're going to have to bring forward to those squarely in power. And that's the work we have to do no matter who's president, because all of them are way to the to the right of, of where we need to be. Um, and that's what has me encouraged, though, is that this moment, you know, Dr. King said, only when it's darkest can you see the stars. I mean, 2020 is dark, right? But But the stars are, are this activism. The stars are the organizing. The stars are the, 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 the new radical possibilities that used to only be at the world, you know, the social forum or, or our, our, our book talks or, you know, in, in an independent bookstore or, you know, or, or, or the radical, you know, thread on Twitter. Now, suddenly we talk about this in, 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 in public space with decent folk. You know what I'm saying? And, and we can have this conversation in a different way. And I'm energized and I'm excited by it. You know? Anyway, Jim, I, I know we, we got some people who got questions and comments. So let's do that, too. Yeah, this conversation has been brilliant um, and really, really refreshing and, and helpful. Um, we've got a lot of questions, some really great questions. We can only get to a few, but um, so I'm going to try to bring together a couple of them. I mean, I think some of what Mark was just talking about, there's a lot of questions about organization and mobilization in this moment. Um, and I think I'll combine two parts of it. One is, um, what do you all see as vehicles or organizations um, that can, you know, help us organize resistance in this moment. Um, and secondly, um, you know, I think we've been hearing so much about, you know, who's Biden going to put on his on this, uh, his transition team and all that. 
but what are the um, what do wins for the movement? I mean, you talked about the um, the the fault lines um, that are coming up in the Democratic Party, but what do wins for the movement under a Biden administration look like? Um, so you know, both local organizing, national organizing uh, perspectives, um, et cetera. So I'll, I'll just say, I think that, um, you know, there's two approaches, as we see, that the capitalist state can take. One is treating everyone uh, the way that the meatpacking industry treated its workforce, which is, we're just going to let the virus rip, and if you can't handle it, you'll die. Everyone else will get it, will force herd immunity, and we'll just move on and, and act as if nothing uh, is happening. And then there's the other response, which is that that actually won't work with the economy because you need people uh, to not be afraid for their lives. Uh, schools will not open because there are teacher unions. People ask, why, why is everybody else going back to work except teachers? Because they have unions, that's why. And so unions and teachers will not die for public school systems uh, who refuse to you know, fix things so that they are actually uh, uh, safe because they don't have the money. Um, the money is being uh, restrained from the Trump administration uh, because they're trying to force people um, back uh, out uh, during the, the pandemic. So my expectation is that uh, the Biden administration uh, will it l rationally come to the conclusion that this strategy has failed um, and that we need to try something uh, different, that they might use the uh, production capacities of, uh, you know, the, the, the legislation that, that Trump used to make 40 billion, um, uh, what are those things, um, ventilators, mm -hmm. but no gloves, no masks, and no gowns, that they might actually use that legislation uh, or executive order to um, create in 90, you know, the 95 masks for healthcare providers, um, that they might release uh, uh, federal money and make that available uh, to cities um, and, and states so that they can actually uh, function, that they might be able to conjure some deal or something so that people get some money um, and that it's not, as AOC described it, the free fall into hell. Um, and so I think any response, to be honest, would be a win. Uh, because there has been no response. The federal government has thrown up its hand, hands and said, you guys are on your own. No one is in control. So having some intervention, I think as far as like um, groups, I mean, there are a lot of groups. There are a million different groups doing uh, a million different things. I think for me, it's those are great, but we also need big groups. We need what one might describe as mass organizations that allow the different groups to be in touch with each other, but that also mean that the mass can, can flex its side, uh, whether that is through collective, more organized uh, uh, demonstrations that concentrate our forces, whether it's the creation of publications that allow us to influence ideas and politics and debates in ways that we don't now that has been totally left to the right and the Republican Party who do that all the time and through the mainstream media and through their own uh, types of media. So we have to, you know, because I don't think that, that as a left, we have the collective power and ability uh, to do those things yet because we are, we are enormously dispersed uh, right now. And so that's not to say we need one big group doing one single thing, um, but we do need more collaboration, cohesion, communication between the uh, proliferating smaller groups of people 
who are doing tremendously important work on the ground, uh, but that many of us are, aren't actually in communication with. I agree. Yeah, I agree fully. Uh, they're, they're the front line, rising majority, um, are, are two kind of constellations trying to form this united front, this mass united front. I do think um, the left for it to continue to be respectable, viable, powerful, um, needs to needs to consider the viability of, of uh, vanguards or groups that are not afraid to take, <clears throat> to just move the entire left um, uh, farther to the left and more clear in its analysis. Um, but that's, that's, I think that's all a part of building the container that Kianga is talking about where we're actually in communication with one another um, beyond social media where we can have conversations that aren't relegated to Twitter and, and, and those things. And we can really say, hey, I think this has been a, a toxic thing for the movement. This is apolitical. This is not political. This is actually counter-revolutionary and reactionary, and we need to move this way. And there needs to be a constellation of people, whether it's one org or others, that are, are really clear about um, forming a strong left flank in this country. And, and not just ideologically, but is actually practicing governance, taking local power, experimenting, et cetera, and, and be clear with that, and not about making mass friends but but leading a mass army um and i think we should give no quarter to any cabinet appointment i think the cabinet process should become one of the hardest that any president has ever kind of experienced i think what we do usually is when we choose a president we kind of treat them like a new football coach or a basketball coach and we're like yeah of course they're going to hire their own offensive coordinator it's their scheme and then, of course, they're going to hire their own defensive coordinator. It's their scheme. I don't know their scheme, but we hired them, so we trust every decision. And I think this is an opportunity for us to kind of really flex. And I think there are a lot of people who are like, let Biden do his thing and let's see what happens. And I think we should give no quarter to any cabinet appointment. There should be mass mobilization. As hard as we went against Bessie DeVos, we should go against Rahm Emanuel. And we should really, 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 I a win, in addition to what Kianga said, a win for the left under a Biden administration is that Joe Biden regrets every day that he decided to take this on, that he, <laughs> that, that, you know, that yes. he, you know, that he, he decides every day, you know, that fighting for the soul of America was probably not the best thing to do right now. And that should be because of the left and not the right. I agree wholeheartedly. The only thing I would quickly add is around an organizational question is, and I'm, you know, and there are skilled organizers who can answer this better, but I also just would add that we should also, um, continue to nurture intellectual spaces um, for political education and growth. You know, as a as an independent bookstore owner, um, one of the things that I, the, the, the greatest joy I have is playing a small slice in my own community in, in nurturing those kinds of conversations by the books we offer, by the, by the authors we bring in, by the conversations that we allow to happen. And there's a long history of, of radical bookstores in particular, really radical feminist bookstores um, in the 60s and 70s, um, particularly, um, creating space for political education. But when I think about my own political formation, and I think about those of others, so many of us, uh, it was independent bookstores, it was basement conversations, it was um, sidewalk tables, it was, and now it, it was these counter public spaces where you could offer different texts, different traditions, different political ideologies, and people could be moved to have different kinds of conversations. Um, and I think that one in the age of digital media and social media, uh, which sometimes takes people who really should be far away from each other and brings them together and takes people who should be close together and pulls them apart. Um, we should we should continue to forge physical spaces, I think, to have this. But I also think that there are, because there's just something about movement work that I think you need to be in, in proximity with people. And that might be my own generational bias, I'm sure. There's somebody who would say there's all kinds of ways to do it via DM and TikTok, and I'm not dismissive of that, although it just sounded like I am. Um, but I'm open to possibilities. I, I don't know how to do that, but I'd be open to having that conversation. But even within the digital sphere, we have to nurture spaces like, like, like you know, so that we're not just talking in 180 characters, so that we're not just, you know, you know, posting, you know, you know, quasi radical quips, you know, but that we're actually having engaged, sustained, difficult 
um, conversation. Some, some of the greatest political growth I've achieved has been when I'm in community and intellectual con- engagement and conversation with folk. And I think we need to do that. And I've seen some interesting spaces. Of course, there's book, there's uh, bookstores. There's also like No Name um, has the No Name Book Club. And I'm looking at the books that they're reading. I'm looking at the radical texts that they're engaging and they're taking very, very seriously. And, you know, some of these texts and some of these traditions are being engaged more in fact, they've always been engaged more out of formal educational context than they have in, in inside of them. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm excited to see those developed and nurtured because at the moment where we need this radical vision, um, we need a radical education. And we gotta create, we gotta craft spaces for it because it's not gonna happen within the neoliberal, technocratic, corporatized university. It's not gonna happen in K-12 education. It's gonna happen in the spaces that we create. Hey, I just, I, add, I, oh, sorry. No, I was just gonna say really quick, I live in Philly. I live about 1.1 miles away from um, Mark's bookstore, Uncle Bobby's. And, you know, before this pandemic, I just think it, Mark's not just, you know, having a freedom dream here. Every, like, multiple days out of the week, you can go to Uncle Bobby's. And not only are people just sitting around, you know, talking, and this this is like a legit cafe bookstore. It's not, you know, a rec center. Um, But like every night there's a book talk, there's a meeting. And then, you know, every three or four months, there's like some big forum. And so the intentionality that has been put into uh, creating that kind of space, you know, in a black working class uh, neighborhood, that people flock to from across the city um, can't be underestimated uh, in terms of uh, the meaning and value of political education and, and really taking that seriously. So it's, a, it, it's truly been a model for what that could look like. It, uh, just really quickly, uh, on the political education thing, there's a, that's another pandemic possibility. We have millions of kids who are not being programmed by their teachers. And if they are, they're, half, they're halfway watching them on the computer. And so th- w- there, there is a generation of kids who are coming up, not only watching the social movements on social media, but also not being bludgeoned by American history. I mean, this our education system is fracturing in so many ways right now. And so for revolutionary groups and organizations, parents, if you have time to, to, to use that opportunity, whereas eight years you were exporting a whole manner of constraint on your kids, um, now they're home. This is a real opportunity for radical education things and parents will be very, very grateful for radical political education schools that want to take their kids and keep them in a safe environment, socially distanced, but give them some for known <laughs> in fifth grade. Let's Word. do it. <laughs> Word. Um, so I have one more question and then maybe we can end with a, some freedom dreams. But um, I just want to remind people to get multiple copies of Mark's book, share it, share it with your book club that you're going to start tomorrow. Uh, read it, talk about it, discuss it, um, get it from Uncle Bobby's to keep that crucial institution alive uh, through the pandemic. Um, I just wanted to ask about, um, you know, we all discussed how the defeat of Donald Trump was not the ultimate defeat of fascism. And so it would be remiss not to talk about what is the continuing threat of the right under a Biden administration. Um, you know, at the same time as the Democrats are saying we need to accommodate to it, they're also in denial about the significance of Donald Trump's base and the people that voted for him and his continued relevance as a political figure. So I wonder if you could talk about that a little bit. I'll jump in super quick. I, I do think the threat is what we were saying earlier. The right that is ascending is not um, buffoonish. They have Prager U. They have young, Mm. attractive voices. Um, They have skilled communicators. They have a sprawling online infrastructure. And not all of it is hate black people. Not all of it is blah, 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 blah. You know, any manner of things that we view as just repulsive. Um, And I don't think the other stuff is not repulsive, but that what they've done is they, they understand packaging. They understand, and I think that is not the only threat, but one of the primary ones that we don't talk about is how their message is continuing to be alluring. And as working with black men this year, um, I 
found those conversations that they're having. And I, I could see how one plus one equals three sometimes to people who have yep. been looking to the Democrats for the answer and even looking to social movements for the answer who talk above them or um, who, who, who talk at them or after they're in the streets, take all the money and got blue checks and Soros. I've had my own friends ask me about Soros, right? I had to explain and break it down. It takes five to seven minutes, but this is what mm -hmm. is happening. And they are defining the arena by which we are operating on and they're inoculating young people against our message. And they're saying, we have the answer. Look at them. If you don't agree with them, they dispose of you. If you don't know the words, they don't want you. If you don't, you know, and that's what they're saying about us. And in some ways we walk in that proudly, but we've got to be, once again, the social movements of the left need to be really, really open door people. And, you know, with Black Men Build, we say, come as you are, grow as you go. Yeah, you're definitely on our team. You might not play in the game today because you've got some work to do, but you're on the team. You know, you're definitely with us. You know what I'm saying? Um, and so I think that is one of the dangers that we have to we have to prepare for a younger, um, really dynamic right that believes that they have the answers and believes that they are the inclusion people. They are the working class people. The leader of the Proud Boys is a Venezuelan from Miami. Phil, we're going to need a book out of you. I'm just Word. saying. <laughs> you, you take it easy now, but, you know, we're going to need a book out of you. Um, I'll do, you do the forward? Yes, and the backwards. <laughs> I'll do it all. I mean, this is, this is, yes, I, the only thing that I will say, just thinking about it coming out, of the election and all of the information isn't isn't available yet and you know we still got to figure some of this out but um i've looked at the the fact that 18 percent of um black men voted yep. uh, for donald trump um the donald trump increased uh his numbers among black women uh by three percent over 2016 so i think it's something like 800,000 black women voted for Trump. Um, and then the inroads among uh, Mexicans in South Texas. And so, you know, when you raise some of this as a question as to how do we figure out what is attractive about Trumpism so we can say something about it, you know, part of the responses are are you, why are you, you're blaming black people and, and Latinos for Trump's victory? And it's like, no, no. But the fact is, for the Democratic Party in the 21st century, their appeal among black and Latino voters peaked with Obama in 2008. So if you look at black men, they went from 2008, 96% uh, for Obama in 2008, to 87% in 2012, to 82% uh, in uh, 2016, to 80% this year, at the very least, that should provoke curiosity. Um, and so I think we don't know exactly, the exit polls don't tell us who they were. What, you know, we know that 19% of that um, uh, came from people uh, who were uh, 30 to uh, 49. 10% um, came from 50 to or uh, 50 to 60 or something like that. Um, but we don't know the income. We don't know those sorts of things. But what I do know is that uh, there's the stuff that Phil is talking about, um, and then there is it resonates with some people both the economy, I mean, it is true that the, the economy under Trump, even if it was part of the Obama recovery, he sees the rhetoric around this and it was a historic low unemployment rate for black people, right? And so when Biden is just saying, wear a mask and we have a plan and Trump is saying, oh, you just wanna shut the country down again, Right, that you have to have a, a robust response to that. When Trump says, "Why are you going with the Democratic Party, who you know have screwed you over 
for the last 50 years? Like, you have to have a response and can't just say, well, when Trump talks about the Democrats in these Democrat-led cities, you know, Trump says it, so we're just going to ignore it. Because it's true. Right. It's true. If you're in Philly, if you're in Baltimore, if you're in Detroit, if you're in Chicago, if you're in L.A., what has been the political regime that oversees the daily indignities of life? It's the Democratic Party. And so you have to have something more to say than, well, Trump said it, so it's illegitimate. So there's, there's ways in which we have handcuffed ourselves to, to be able to address these issues. And part of it is because the handcuffs are connected to the Democratic Party. Um, and that makes it difficult to then really have a frank discussion about what the root of the problems are and what to deal, do with about it. And the last thing I'll say is living in a swing state in Pennsylvania, some of the commercials, like there was one, and you know, if you watch, I watch a lot of sports. And so, you know, NFL games, former black uh, football players for Trump every Sunday. Or the, the most, the craziest one I saw last week was a, a, a Trump ad with Joe Biden, only Joe Biden giving a speech on the floor of the Senate around the crime bill in mm. 1993, just saying the most insanely racist stuff about uh, these people coming after uh, my mother, my wife, my daughter, my family interspersed with black men talking about being in jail, talking about being in prison. That's all, going back and forth, vote Trump. I mean, you have to be, Trump embraces his racism, but says, I'll get you a job. I'll hook you up. <laughs> Biden, well, the experts told us that crack was bad. And, you know, like, there's never been a full conversation about what, where his reckoning happened, where his transformation uh, uh, happened. So all that is to say that we can't just put our heads in the sand and pretend it's not happening. We have to engage. And to engage doesn't mean that now we don't want to talk about the plight of black women or now you know we're decentering black people to talk about white people. To me, and AOC kind of talked to this in her interview, this is about basic math. The idea that black people alone can in lead and, and successfully win a struggle to transform yes. this country is erroneous. We need people, we need solidarity. And it's not on the basis of denying that racism exists, but you have to engage, you have to have the conversation. Otherwise, we are not going to win, we will not succeed. And so that's the kind of approach we have to take in dealing with the wide ranging uh, um, issues with the right. It's not all neo-Nazis. There is a, a, a big section of neo-Nazis that we have to confront in the streets. But then there are other people that we have to engage with and try to win to a different kind of understanding of, of what is happening. Absolutely. Um, so we have one more question from uh, Michael Eric Dyson, who's watching, um, who's asking you all, uh, or maybe Mark, um, I think it's related to the last question, but um, how do you balance the legitimate progressive criticism of Harris and her support of Biden policies and the undeniable pride among the black masses for her ascent? It's a great question. Shout out to Michael Eric Dyson, my friend, my mentor, my big brother without whom so much of this would not be possible. Um, I, I, I think that um, it's a great question. I'm, I'm curious to know what uh, what Phil and Kianga think as well. Um, I think that the, the pride that black folk have um, in Kamala Harris, just as they had in Barack Obama, is grounded in something legitimate. And I, and I think that too often, particularly those of us who identify as left leaning folk or folk on the left can be dismissive um, of that pride, of that joy in ways that undermine our ability to build bonds of solidarity and to do the political work that needs to be done. Um, to dismiss that as pure false consciousness or, this, you know, or that they have the world wrong, I think it's not only bad strategy, I think it's actually a bad analysis. 
um, black folk have always been more sophisticated um, and more more thoughtful um, about what's going on in the world than than we're often given credit for. Um, the I, even when you when you think about black folk voting Democrat in large blocks, um, it's not because we don't have a critique of of racism on the left or on the Democratic Party or because we don't we, we don't think through uh, what's at stake. Um, but sometimes it's a pragmatic analysis of of what's on the table. You know, as Baldwin said, uh, you know, in '76, it, it, it's it's a means of buying time, right? And that sometimes we 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 we're making strategic choices so that we can live another day and so that we can struggle another day. And while I may sometimes disagree with the particular tactic or strategy that's being used, it's not without intentionality. Um, and I think Black Joy, in response to the the the, the ascension of of Kamala Harris, is in and of itself a, a, a certain kind of response to something. White Black folk, I think, I mean, there are Black folk who are just happy to see Black folk do something, right? That's the first Black garbage man on my block. Yo, that's the first. I mean, we don't care what it, you, just being the first Black something is its own thing. And 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 I think there's a critique to be made of that. But I think there's also an understanding of how Kamala Harris has been subjected to very particular forms of critique that I think are unfair and, and grounded in 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 in, in uh, patriarchy and in in and in, in, in racism, quite frankly. You know, the critiques of uh, everything from her husband to the kind of weird uh, nativist kind of impulses that come under. You know, is she black? Is she black? Black was her great grandmama a slave? You know, is she? You know, I mean, the, the kinds of questions that emerge, I think, are particular to her. And in even the, the questioning of her of her of her blackness are emerge in a way that didn't for Obama, and, and 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 if you were to take a real crude analysis of what makes you black, I mean she has a much more compelling and strong case uh, than he would, both in practice and in terms of just the pure, you know, the stuff that I don't buy into. But I'm just saying, even if if I if I it it wouldn't necessarily make sense, right? And and I think some of the critics are heavily gendered and, and troublesome. I, I think that. Um, watching black folk navigate a system like that and be quote unquote successful, I think promotes a certain kind of pride, but also a certain sense um, of possibility. Um, I think at the same time that we hold on to that, we have to subject them to in, in incredible scrutiny and 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 challenge them. I think um, some people have managed to do that well in in in, 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 prin in, in principle ways. That is to say, they've been able to to um, hold power accountable. Um, they've been able to say, look, I, I see why we in the streets dancing, but we got work to do tomorrow. We got work to do tonight. Um, I see why y'all, you know, I see why the AKAs are, are, are lined up, you know, um, at the polls to get to get Trump out of office and, 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 and to celebrate th their soror, you know, or the Howard people, because you can't talk to anybody from Howard for more than 10 seconds without finding out that they went to Howard, that, that the Howard folk um, have a, a tremendous pride in her, but also say, OK, now that she's in office, what are we going to do about the fact that um, a law and order regime really means the, the, the continued militarization of our streets? You know, what does it mean to to think about um, what's happening at the border and to say that the Trump response was cruel and inhumane? Of course, um, but what's happening at the border prior to Trump's administration was also cruel and inhumane, not to the level of its family separation, a lot of kids in cages, um, but, but still um, there's still contradictions that have to be wrestled. with. It's it's a I want that black joy. I want to think about that black at, at, at the existential level, our level. I want to think about it also as rising, right? That joy can be used as a way to mobilize and galvanize people around something better, bigger, as opposed to using it as opposed to seeing it as using it as against the, the, the intellectual and political sophistication of black folk. Um, for me, that's the kind of conversation that I try to have around it, um, and it's hard. You know, I was in I was. You know, I remember in 08, this is the last thing I'll say, I remember in 08, I remember writing a piece called Not My Brand of Hope in January of 08. And I got trashed for it. Um, I was surprised Skip published it in The Root. Um, you know, and, and, and the reason is because there were so many black folk who were so invested in the Obama candidacy that there was no space to have that kind of critique. Um, and, and I know the kind of critiques we're going to get for, 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 for challenging not just the Biden presidency, right, which is seen as kind of um, an, a kind of extension of the Obama presidency for a lot of people, um, but also to challenge a black, the first black, first woman, first South Asian, first, I mean, all the all the first that, that she encompasses, um, first black neoliberal Zionist, <laughs> you know, <laughs> vice, vice president. I mean, it's all this stuff, right? I, 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 
we got to have space to have that analysis, but also to keep track of, of the ways that that that, that all, so many of these analyses are undergirded by again patriarchy and sexism and 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 and, and anti blackness. We got we got to have space for all that stuff, and I think that's the best way to do it. I think some critics have managed to do that. I think others um, have have to, to to keep those those things in balance. I'll just say it super quick that um, I think it will. Uh, it doesn't necessarily matter what we think. What will make a, a difference is what they do. Um, COVID is the third leading cause of death uh, for uh. African Americans. Um, it it is raging, out of control. There will be, but by the time Biden and Harris take office, there will be uh, projections of up to seventy four thousand. Uh, more people dead because of the way this administration is ignoring that. And so um, I think, you know, they will either uh, confirm their legacy or not based on uh, the the response um, that they have. And I think in the same way uh, that black people remained deeply prideful of uh, Barack Obama over the course of his administration, um, it really had no bearing on the explosion of Black Lives Matter in the midst of that, uh, because at the end of the day, um, people need the government to work. They need relief uh, from what is actually um, happening in the society. And so that might mean you say favorable things in the approval rating, um, and then you know, you're know you out in the streets as, as, as well. And then at the end of your term, 52% of people say that you didn't do enough for black people. Um, so, you know, we can, we can live with all those uh, contradictions. Nobody wants to, you know, my mother was an AKA, my father was an alpha. Um, but, you know, people want solutions to uh, what's happening. And that's ultimately why they voted. Kamala Harris was uh, one of the first people to get out of the Democratic Party primary because she actually had no traction with black voters. Um, so, so people are looking for solutions to uh, the bewildering problems that confront this country right now, and that will be the main determinant um, in, you know, what type of, of reputation and uh, you have, and, and how much glory people hold you in. Well, this um, has been an incredible conversation. It feels it's a shame to cut it short, but. Um, I do want to remind people to pick up a copy of Mark's book, continue the conversation in your local networks, national networks, et cetera. Um, just uh, in the chat, people will be posting the, some upcoming Haymarket events, including on Wednesday with David Harvey and Amna Akbar, on Thursday with S.A. Smythe, Zoe Samudzi, uh, Badur Alagra, and uh, Robin D.G. Kelly. Um, and so I'll just give you all the last word. Um, if you want to close with any of the any, we've covered so much ground about possibility, but um, it feels like we could end on a uh, question of you know possibility. Um, so, you know, I, 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 and I'll be I'll be I'll be real brief, man. I am um, I, I'm I'm so excited um, again to be here with everybody. Um, I, this moment is so dark and it's so frustrating and it's so exhausting. Um, but I honestly have, have never been more certain that we'll be victorious. And, and I said that at the beginning, and I want to say that at the end. I've, I've never been more certain. The energy is there. The ideas are there. I mean, there's a, gener there, there's a generation of people on the street right now. Forget about the, all, all the other. There are people on the street right now who, in their first actions, were calling to defund and abolish police. I mean, that's some shit. We... We just did that that, that. that was outside of the realm of possibility for us 20 years ago. Again, we might say that critical resistance. We might mm -hmm. talk about it, in a, but but on the streets and in Congress, you know, what I, mean? I mean, what's possible right now is is, is so much clearer to me. Um, and so I'm I'm inspired by that. I'm excited by the possibilities, and I'm excited by the fact that um, despite the moment, people are still invested in ideas, and people are still invested to struggle. Um, and, and they keep trying to kill us. You know, I, the, the, and, and two more quick things. One, I, I didn't say this at the beginning. I do want to send love and shout out my, my comrade and brother, Frank Barat, uh, for engaging me in the conversations that allowed this book to happen. Um, but, you know, the conversations with Frank were critical to this, and, and um, mm -hmm. I, I didn't want to ignore that. 
Um, but I, I, they, they've tried to do everything they can to marginalize us, to erase us, to kill us, to destroy us, you know, and we still here and we always will be. And, 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 and I want people to know that as they enter this next leg of the fight, because this one is going to be a tougher one. This is the one that's going to make, make you a little bit more lonely, mm-hmm. you know, um, being, being in the battle against Trump makes you the majority, Right. You king in sixty three, you know mm-hmm. that's kind of be king in sixty eight, mm-hmm. and, and and that's a different kind of battle. That's that that's the stuff that gets you lonely, and you might not have a hundred thousand people, which you might just have a hundred, but as Fidel said, it'll be with those who had absolute faith, and that it's better to make revolution with a small number of people with absolute faith, and that's what we're going to do right now. And when we win, everybody will say they were with you. That's how every action is, right? Once you're successful, everybody pretended they were there the whole time. But this small number of people are going to make victory happen. We're going to do it. We're going to win. And I just want everybody to know that and to be excited by that, to be energized by that. And so when we have those lonely moments, let's turn to each other. Let's study together. Let's read. Let's find moments for joy. Let's find moments for laughter. But let's keep fighting. Let's keep pressing. And we will win because we're still here. King, I want you to have the last one. So I'm going to jump in. Is that okay? Okay. Yeah, that'll be super quick. Um, so for me, uh, as I've alluded to a few times, I'm working with an organization called Black Men Build. As the name implies, we're hoping to build black men. It's a place for black men to engage this country and the world politically, but we're not black men for black men's sake. We want to be a place, as I said earlier, where black men can come as they are and grow as they go. We want to be a part of the building of a new man, a man that feels, a man that loves, a man that can express the vulnerabilities and intimacies that are entitled to all human beings. And I want for anybody who is on here who's a friend of one to get them involved with us. And so my my last word is an organizing push um, because we are losing as we as we um, refuse to or are scared of or are tired of. Um, organizing or reaching out to black men, um, we are losing them and we're, we're vanishing from all manner of places. And as, as it was also said, this isn't about decentering anyone um, at all. We want to bring black men into the movement as servants, as stewards, as leaders, as speakers, as servers. Um, but we cannot have them on the sidelines or being recruited by the right any far, any further or any longer. Mm. Um, and for the comrades on the left, I'll leave with my absolute uh, favorite quote, and I think should guide us from Amilcar Cabral, hide nothing from the masses of the people, tell no lies, expose lies whenever they are told, mask no difficulties, mistakes, or failures, claim no easy victories. That's great. Um, thanks to uh, Haymarket for putting this event together. Um, I really, you know, Mark and, and Phil are two of my favorite people that I always love uh, to to talk about politics and um, possibilities and you know also basketball. Um, <laughs> I, I I have texted Mark in the middle of the the night watching the Sixers game only for him to pick up at what was like two a.m. and Amon Jordan and say that somehow he too was watching this game. So um, so it runs deep. Yeah. Um, what the the only thing I, I will add is you know I don't think that we're a a small minority. I think that we're actually a majority. And when we look at like the, the issues and causes that are most important to us, um, they are, you know, robust majorities that I think that we are, uh, going with the stream around Medicare for all, uh, around trillion, multi-trillion dollar packages for COVID, uh, around a solution to the housing question. And for those who aren't fully with us, they're open Uh, to what it is that we have to say. And so my mantra has been that we have to develop the tools to communicate our ideas, to engage in the battle of ideas and to fight for people and not just throw up our hands and and dismiss people because they don't immediately agree with us because that's not politics. And if that's our posture, you know, then we're, our movement's not going to grow. And if we think that we can fight the right, in this reactionary machine of both Democrats and Republicans with you know us and our 12 best friends who have figured it all out, then we are sadly mistaken. And so we need a posture of engagement, of openness, of being hard on you know, issues of, of 
uh, racism and gender discrimination and, and sexism and all of that, but with the understanding that people's ideas are fluid, people are fluid, that what you think today might not be what you think a week from now, um, but you, we can't do that if we have a posture uh, of non-engagement. And so now, you know, it's clearer where, where uh, uh, things are at and the battles that will need to be uh, fought um, you know, and we have to uh, really engage with that and create the, the tools that are necessary um, to try to win uh, the mass movement that we need in order to be, um, to be successful. And I'm, you know, I, I am optimistic uh, about that just from what I saw in the streets this past summer. Uh, 15 to 26 million people white people in places where there are no black people who came out um, in defiance of uh, public authorities to say that black lives matter. Um, I think that is, a, is, is an important foundation that our movement can build upon and grow um, in the ways that we want, that we think are important uh, in this struggle for a better world. So thanks again for organizing this, it's been a great conversation. Thank you.